The cosmos looked very different. Gas and dark matter clouds were just starting to coalesce as gravity took hold. It was also around this time that the first stars, composed entirely of hydrogen and helium, began to develop. Astonishingly, however, by this time, some enormous black holes with masses of up to one billion stellar masses had developed. In the standard model of black hole creation and growth, it would take billions of years for a black hole to expand to one billion solar masses, and the universe is less than one billion years old. Furthermore, if the present models of black holes are correct, then quasars and other extremely massive black holes should not have developed during that time period, but they were actually around in the primordial cosmos when the cosmos was young. How did the largest black holes form? How did they put on so much weight in such a short amount of time? Only a few million years after all is said and done, how does this new information affect our present knowledge of black hole birth? First, let me give you a quick overview of what a quasar is. It is a supermassive black hole that spins very quickly and consumes plasma at the core of faraway galaxy, a phenomenon known as an active galactic nucleus. Quasars are extremely luminous and strong things in the cosmos. The brightness of some quasars can be billions of times that of our own Milky Way. The fascinating mystery, though, is what gives these things their incredible strength. The surrounding surroundings, of course. Quasars are typically found in galaxies with extremely high gas abundances. As the gas falls into the black hole in such a dense area, it heats up as it swirls around the event horizon. That's why it gives off radioactivity across the board in terms of frequency. Generally speaking, quasars are only discovered in extremely remote galaxies because local supermassive black holes do not have such large amounts of gas. Arcarian 231 is one of the closest quasars, but it's still about 600 million light years distant. The question then becomes how such majestic revolving constructions come into being. There are currently two major hypotheses that can account for the overall creation of black holes. According to the first and most popular hypothesis, the death of a large star can result in the creation of a black hole with a mass of up to about 100 times that of the sun. With enough time, this dark vortex can swallow its surroundings. It causes the black hole to expand in size until it attains a supermassive state with a mass several million to several billion times that of the sun. But experts agree that no black hole could ever devour enough matter in 500 million years to reach the mass of a billion suns. This is because as material falls into a black hole, it forms a circle called an accretion disk. As it orbits the black hole, the material in this ring achieves velocities close to that of light. As a result of the g-forces, the disk heats up and emits a wide range of rays. This radiation exerts such a strong force that it drives away adjacent matter, slowing the black hole's rate of mass ingestion. Theoretical upper bound on a black hole's growth rate, as determined by the Eddington mass. Even if a black hole is capable of sucking in matter at a rate greater than the limit, the increased accumulation is still likely to result in strong gusts. The development will be halted as the nearby material is blown away by the strong gusts. The rate of black hole growth is capped by these variables. If this situation plays out, it would run counter to the idea that quasars formed in the normal manner in the early universe. Now we can discuss the alternative hypothesis for how quasars originate. According to it, Black holes with masses up to 100,000 times that of the sun formed when short-lived stars, some of which may have had lives of nearly 250,000 years eventually imploded. Since this black hole was so enormous, it could have easily accreted billions of stellar masses in a short period of time. Furthermore, it is estimated that the initial mass of a quasar must be between 10,000 and 100,000 stellar masses, which lends credence to this hypothesis. However, the parent star must be exceedingly massive, nearly tens of thousands of times more massive the than the sun. Very different. Such a black Gas and dark matter clouds were just starting to coalesce as gravity took hold. It was also around this time that the first stars, composed entirely of hydrogen and helium, began to develop. Astonishingly, however, by this time, some enormous black holes with masses of up to one billion stellar masses had developed. In the standard model of black hole creation and growth, 
It would take billions of years for a black hole to expand to one billion solar masses, and the universe is less than one billion years old. Furthermore, if the present models of black holes are correct, then quasars and other extremely massive black holes should not have developed during that time period, but they were actually around in the primordial cosmos when the cosmos was young. How did the largest black holes form? How did they put on so much weight in such a short amount of time? Only a few million years after all is said and done, how does this new information affect our present knowledge of black hole birth? First, let me give you a quick overview of what a quasar is. It is a supermassive black hole that spins very quickly and consumes plasma at the core of a faraway galaxy, a phenomenon known as an active galactic nucleus. Quasars are extremely luminous and strong things in the cosmos. The brightness of some quasars can be billions of times that of our own Milky Way. The fascinating mystery, though, is what gives these things their incredible strength. The surrounding surroundings, of course. Quasars are typically found in galaxies with extremely high gas abundances. As the gas falls into the black hole in such a dense area, it heats up as it swirls around the event horizon. That's why it gives off radioactivity across the board in terms of frequency. Generally speaking, quasars are only discovered in extremely remote galaxies because local supermassive black holes do not have such large amounts of gas. Markarian 231 is one of the closest quasars, but it's still about 600 million light years distant. The question then becomes how such majestic revolving constructions come into being. There are currently two major hypotheses that can account for the overall creation of black holes. According to the first and most popular hypothesis, the death of a large star can result in the creation of a black hole with a mass of up to about 100 times that of the sun. With enough time, this dark vortex can swallow its surroundings. It causes the black hole to expand in size until it attains a supermassive state with a mass several million to several billion times that of the sun. But experts agree that no black hole could ever devour enough matter in 500 million years to reach the mass of a billion suns. This is because as material falls into a black hole, it forms a circle called an accretion disk. As it orbits the black hole, the material in this ring achieves velocities close to that of light. As a result of the g-forces, the disk heats up and emits a wide range of rays. This radiation exerts such a strong force that it drives away adjacent matter, slowing the black hole's rate of mass ingestion. Theoretical upper bound on a black hole's growth rate as determined by the Eddington mass. Even if a black hole is capable of sucking in matter at a rate greater than the limit, the increased accumulation is still likely to result in strong gusts. The development will be halted as the nearby material is blown away by the strong gusts. The rate of black hole growth is capped by these variables. If this situation plays out, it would run counter to the idea that quasars formed in a normal manner in the early universe. Now we can discuss the alternative hypothesis for how quasars originate. According to it, black holes with masses up to 100,000 times that of the sun formed when short-lived stars, some of which may have had lives of nearly 250,000 years, eventually imploded. Since this black hole was so enormous, it could have easily accreted billions of stellar masses in a short period of time. Furthermore, it is estimated that the initial mass of a quasar must be between 10,000 and 100,000 stellar masses, which lends credence to this hypothesis. However, the parent star must be exceedingly massive, nearly tens of thousands of times more massive than the sun for such a black hole to form. The birth of such enormous stars has never been observed in the observable cosmos. Even the heaviest star ever found is only about 300 times as big as the sun. Additionally, there is no known process that can currently propel the creation of stars with masses many times that of the sun. However, we also know that circumstances in the early cosmos were different from what we see now. As a result, such stars could have developed in the early cosmos. As shown by simulations, Massive stars might have developed at the intersections of strong Concept streams of, of Big dense Bang, and originally intended as a somewhat derisive term, poses a paradox in its name. It wasn't particularly big, considering our belief that the universe originated from a singularity, and there was no literal bang since there was no air to transmit vibrations. 
Today, the Big Bang Theory is a well-established pillar of science, widely accepted and understood. However, acceptance and comprehension are distinct realms. While the Big Bang Theory has solidified its place in our understanding of the universe, it hasn't yet unraveled all the mysteries science seeks to answer about the birth of our cosmos. Conventional Big Bang Theory remains silent on what triggered the bang, why it occurred, or what transpired before it. At this very moment, we find ourselves in the aftermath of the Big Bang. Everything we see, hear, taste, smell, and touch is aftermath. This is the Earth, a marvel of silicon and oxygen, encasing a metallic core. Its surface is dominated by vast oceans fostering a diverse array of life. In a rhythmic dance, the Earth completes a full rotation every 24 hours while encircling the radiant star known as the Sun, completing an orbit every 365 days. The Sun, a radiant giant predominantly composed of hydrogen and helium with a scorching surface temperature nearing 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, converts a staggering 700 million tons of hydrogen into 695 million tons of helium every second. This celestial luminary is at the heart of our solar system, which took shape approximately 4.5 billion years ago. This system has eight planets, from the sweltering Mercury to the frigid Neptune. Our solar system is no static entity, hurtling through space at a staggering 134 miles per second. It is part of a vast congregation of stars and stellar systems, known as the Milky Way galaxy, consisting of around 200 billion stars. Among these, an estimated 6 billion may harbor planetary systems akin to ours. Our solar system orbits the center of the Milky Way on one of its outer arms, just one member of a grand ensemble. The Milky Way is merely one among the vast expanse of more than 125 billion galaxies constituting the observable universe. Indeed, the universe is colossal and its enormity continues to expand. If we rewind time, we can witness the universe contracting, shrinking from a cosmic scale to a galactic one, then to the dimensions of our solar system and further still, until everything is confined within the confines of a studio, a coffee cup, and ultimately, an atom. The vastness of the universe unfolds before us, a cosmic narrative expanding across unimaginable scales. Physicists have pieced together an approximate timeline of significant events in the cosmos of existence using telescope data and models of particle physics. From its beginning to its inevitable demise, we examine key points in the evolution of our universe. Cosmic Inflation Era The next cosmic confab was to rapidly expand in size. The universe may have expanded exponentially after the Big Bang, tearing off previously colliding parts of space. This period known as inflation is still mostly theoretical, but it has gained favor among cosmologists as a possible explanation for the striking similarity between distant parts of space. Attempts to detect this expansion in light from the early cosmos were reported in 2014. Nevertheless, further investigation revealed that the true culprit was nothing more than interplanetary dust causing interference. Quark gluon plasma the temperature of the early cosmos was between 7 trillion and 10 trillion degrees Fahrenheit, or 4 trillion and 6 trillion degrees Celsius, just a few milliseconds after the Big Bang. Quarks, elementary particles ordinarily contained within protons and neutrons, were free to move about at these temperatures. These quarks were combined with gluons, carriers of the basic force known as the strong force, and particle accelerators on Earth. Scientists have replicated these circumstances in both terrestrial atom smashers and the early cosmos. The challenging to achieve condition only lasted for a few fractions of a second. The early epoch, the subsequent period of time beginning perhaps in the neighborhood of a few thousandths of a second following the Big Bang, was a period of intense activity. The universe chilled as it expanded, creating an environment conducive to the merger of quarks into protons and neutrons. The cosmic neutrino background, which has not yet been detected by scientists, was created one second after the Big Bang when the density of the cosmos decreased sufficiently for neutrinos to sail across space without interacting with anything. The first atoms, protons and neutrons, fused together during the first three minutes of the universe's existence, creating the isotope of hydrogen known as deuterium, 
along with helium and a trace quantity of the next lightest element, lithium. Yet, this procedure ceased as the temperature dropped. As the temperature settled down 380,000 years after the Big Bang, hydrogen and helium atoms could join with free electrons to form the first neutral atoms. The cosmic microwave background, a remnant of this epoch first identified in 1965, was created when photons that had previously collided with electrons were able to flow without being disrupted. The Dark Ages, there was a lengthy period of time when nothing in the cosmos emitted any light. The cosmic dark ages refer to this time frame of around 100 million years because practically all of what astronomers know about the cosmos can be gleaned by studying starlight. This era remains exceptionally challenging to study. It's hard to piece together what happened if there are no stars to guide us. The first stars were formed when hydrogen and helium began to compress into massive spheres some 180 million years after the Big Bang, creating hellish temperatures at their centers. After the neutral hydrogen atoms in interstellar space were broken apart into protons and electrons by the intense photons generated by early stars and galaxies, the cosmos entered a period known as cosmic dawn or reionization. It's hard to put a time limit on reionization as it happened so soon after the Big Bang and its signals have been masked by subsequent gas and dust. Thus, the most that scientists can determine is that it was finished by around 500 million years after the Big Bang. Almost a billion years after the Big Bang, supermassive black holes developed at the cores of merging early galaxies. Intense quasars visible from 12 billion light years away switched on and began emitting their bright beams of light. Throughout the subsequent few billion years, the cosmos underwent more evolution. Denser regions in the early cosmos drew more material due to gravity. A gorgeous filamentary cosmic web is the result of them slowly expanding into galaxy clusters and lengthy strands of gas and dust. The birth of the solar system. A yellow star with rings around it formed from a cloud of gas around 4.5 billion years ago in one galaxy. These accreted rings eventually became the eight planets of our solar system, as well as numerous comets, asteroids, dwarf planets, and moons. Either the third planet out from the sun retained a lot of water via this process, or it received a deluge of ice and water from comets. Later on, Earth and humanity emerged. The end or not, it isn't the final chapter, of course. The future of the cosmos is still a mystery to physicists. It is dependent on our ability to accurately quantify the characteristics of dark energy, the unknown factor thought to be accelerating the expansion of the universe. All the stars and all the galaxies will have burned out, and even black holes will evaporate into nothing if the universe continues to expand forever, leaving behind a lifeless cosmos saturated with inner energy. If this scenario comes to pass, alternatively, the Great Crunch, a reversal of the Big Bang in which gravity triumphs over dark energy's expansionary force, will occur. The Great Rip, in which the cosmos rips itself apart, is another possibility if dark energy accelerates everything apart to greater and greater distances. The universe Surreal is full paradoxes. of strange and fascinating Surreal paradoxes challenge our understanding of the world around us. From the mysteries of quantum mechanics to the mind-bending properties of black holes, the universe presents us with a plethora of phenomena that defy our intuition and challenge our perceptions of reality. This video lets you see some of the many things we do not understand in the universe and the strange and surreal paradoxes in what we think we understand. If you are interested in amazing videos about the universe, be sure to subscribe to our channel to stay updated. Everything we know represents just 5% of the universe. What is the rest? Normal matter, protons, neutrons, and electrons make up just 5% of the universe. Staggeringly, the other 95% is something which we cannot fathom, see, or understand. We call it dark matter, which makes up 27% of the universe, and dark energy, which makes up 68%. But what are these mysterious components of our universe? Dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter and dark energy are two mysterious concepts in astrophysics that scientists use to explain some of the strange observations that we make about the universe. Dark matter is a type of matter that does not interact with light or any other form of electromagnetic radiation. This means that we cannot directly detect it using telescopes or other instruments that rely on light. 
However, scientists can infer its existence by observing its gravitational effects on visible matter, such as stars and galaxies. Dark matter is thought to make up about 85% of the total matter in the universe, but we still do not know what it is made of. It does not behave like any of the known particles that make up ordinary matter, such as protons and electrons. Some theories propose that dark matter consists of undiscovered particles that do not interact with light or other forms of radiation, while others suggest that it may be made up of exotic objects, such as black holes. Dark energy, on the other hand, is a hypothetical form of energy that is thought to permeate all of space and is responsible for the accelerating expansion of the universe. Unlike dark matter, which has a gravitational effect that slows down the expansion of the universe, dark energy has a repulsive effect that causes the expansion to speed up. The exact nature of dark energy is not well understood, but it is thought to be a property of space itself rather than a type of matter or energy that we can directly observe. Scientists believe that dark energy makes up about 68% of the total energy in the universe. Dimensions of the universe how many dimensions does the universe have? To the best of our knowledge, the universe as we know it has three special dimensions, length, width, and height, and one dimension of time, making a total of four dimensions in spacetime. This is known as the four-dimensional spacetime. However, some theories in physics, such as string theory, propose that there may be more than four dimensions, possibly up to 11 dimensions, but these extra dimensions are thought to be curled up or compactified, too small to be observed at our scale. This means that although they may exist, they are not directly observable, and their effects on the four-dimensional spastime can only be inferred through their influence on the physical phenomena that we can observe. These additional dimensions would help us unify the mathematical bases of the four fundamental forces of nature, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, and gravity. Do these higher dimensions exist? And if they do, is there a way for us to measure their presence, or will we forever be trapped in our four-dimensional world? The multiverse theory. What if our universe is just one a multitude out there? The idea that our universe is just one of many universes, known as the multiverse theory, is a popular concept in modern cosmology and physics. According to this theory, there may be many other universes existing alongside our own, each with its own unique properties and laws of physics. If this is the case, it would have profound implications for our understanding of the universe and our place in it. For example, it could help explain why our universe appears to be finely tuned to support life, known as the anthropic principle. If there are countless other universes with different physical laws and properties, it would increase the chances of at least one of them being able to support life. The multiverse theory opens up fascinating possibilities the and theory. challenges our understanding. The theory also raises questions about the nature of reality and how we define what is real. If there are many different universes with different physical laws, are they all equally real? Or is our universe the only real one? What is time? Time is one of the most difficult properties of our universe to understand. Researchers say that time is a measurable period, a continuum that lacks spatial dimensions. There seems to be an obvious direction or flow of time, and it seems we can't travel backwards in time. Why is this? Are we trapped in the arrow of time, perpetually moving forwards? Is the passing of time intertwined with the way our universe works? According to the theory of the Big Bang, time itself began together with the rest of the universe about 13.8 billion years ago. Does that mean that it makes no sense to ask what was there before time? Time and Physics Time is a fundamental concept in physics and is often defined as the progression of events from the past through the present and into the future. It is a fundamental dimension in which events occur and is often represented as a continuous line or axis. In the context of physics, time is typically measured in units such as seconds, minutes, hours, and years. It is also an essential component of the space-time continuum which is the four-dimensional fabric of the universe consisting of three special dimensions and one temporal dimension. The flow of time is often described as being unidirectional, meaning that it moves forward and cannot be reversed. This is known as the arrow of time and is often associated with the second law of thermodynamics, which states that entropy, 
the measure of disorder or randomness in a closed system, tends to increase over time. Nature of time. The nature of time is still a topic of ongoing research and debate in physics and philosophy. Some theories propose that time is an emergent property that arises from the complex interactions of the universe's fundamental components, while others suggest that time is a fundamental property of the universe akin to space and matter. Particles violating the laws of nature in certain situations, two particles can seemingly be in instant connection with each other, even if they are located at opposite ends of the universe. The phenomenon is known as quantum entanglement, where two particles can become correlated in such a way that the state of one particle is instantly correlated with the state of the other, regardless of the distance between them. While this may seem like a violation of the laws of nature, it is actually consistent with the principles of quantum mechanics. Quantum entanglement. It is important to know that this does not allow for faster than light communication or the violation of causality. This is because while the state of the entangled particles may be instantaneously correlated, there is no way to control or manipulate this correlation to transmit information faster than the speed of light. In fact, there is a fundamental principle in quantum mechanics known as the no communication theorem, which states that it is impossible to use entanglement to transmit information faster than the speed of light. So while quantum entanglement may seem like a strange and mysterious phenomenon, it does not allow for the violation of the laws of nature or the principles of causality. Life in the universe. Are we alone in the universe? There are at least two trillion galaxies in the observable universe, with more stars and planets in them than all the grains of sand on planet Earth. So, where is everyone? Why haven't we encountered life from elsewhere? Is life incredibly rare or does it have a limited lifetime, destroying itself before it has the chance to seek out other life forms? What does this tell us about the future of humankind? The question of whether or not we are alone in the universe is one of the most intriguing and profound questions we can ask, given the vast size and age of the universe. It seems unlikely that Earth is the only planet with the conditions necessary for life to emerge. There are likely billions of potentially habitable planets in our galaxy alone. However, the fact that we have not yet encountered any definitive Fermi evidence paradox. of extraterrestrial There are many alone. potential explanations for the Fermi paradox, including the possibility that life is indeed rare, that it is difficult for life to evolve beyond a certain point, or that intelligent civilizations have a limited lifespan and self-destruct before they can explore the galaxy. It is also possible that we simply have not looked in the right places yet. Our current methods of searching for extraterrestrial life are still relatively limited, and it is possible that more advanced techniques in the future could uncover evidence of life elsewhere in the universe. The self-reference problem does the self-reference problem distort our perception of the universe? We humans are also part of the universe we inhabit. So when we look out to study the stars and galaxies, are we really neutral observers of the universe? When we explore the universe, we are both observers and the subject of observation. How can we pretend to be neutral when we are deeply embedded in what we explore? Could it be that this self-reference problem affects the way we look at the universe and gives us an overwhelmingly wrong impression? The self-reference problem is indeed a complex issue when it comes to our study and perception of the universe. We are not neutral observers of the universe, but rather we are embedded within it. This self-reference problem can lead to potential distortions in our perception of the universe as we may unwittingly project our own preconceptions and assumptions onto our observations. By acknowledging our own biases and limitations, we can work to develop more rigorous and objective methods of observation and analysis. The universe's fine tuning. Why is the universe seemingly so perfect for us? The universe seems to be perfectly made for us, but why is this? Why do the fundamental constants of our universe, such as the speed of light, have the values that they do, allowing life to exist? Could it be that there are infinite universes with infinite possibilities and we merely happen to live in one that is perfect for life? There are a few possible explanations for this apparent fine-tuning of the universe. One possibility is the anthropic principle, which states that the universe is the way it is because it must be compatible with the existence of observers. In other words, the universe appears fine-tuned for us because, if it were not, we would not be here to observe it. This is sometimes referred to as the selection effect. Entropy and the fate of the universe why is it easier to destroy something than to put it back together? 
Entropy is the amount of disorder, chaos, or randomness in a system. One can never reduce entropy. Everything in the universe slowly moves towards disorder. It's very easy to smash a window, but impossible to put it back together exactly as it was before. The principle of entropy moves the universe from structure to chaos, from an ordered state to disorder. As the universe continues to expand, it will eventually reach a state of maximum entropy, where all matter is uniformly distributed and there is no energy gradient available to drive further processes. This state is known as the heat death of the universe, where the universe will be cold, dark, and lifeless. The universe is not a closed system as it receives energy from stars and other sources, but the overall trend is towards increasing disorder and chaos. However, it is important to note that this process will occur over an extremely long time scale, likely trillions of years in the future. Black holes and white holes. Can anything escape a black hole? We have observed the effects of black holes and we have seen one directly. The gravitational force of these massive objects pulls everything toward them, even light itself. What happens in the mysterious, infinitely dense center of a black hole? Could there exist such things as white holes, the opposites of black holes that spew matter and time into our universe? According to our current understanding of physics, nothing can escape a black hole once it is past the event horizon, which is the point of no return. The gravitational pull of a black hole is so strong that it warps space and time, and anything that crosses the event horizon is inevitably pulled towards the singularity at the center of the black hole, where the laws of physics as we know them break down. As for the possibility of white holes, which are hypothetical objects that are the opposite of black holes, there is currently no direct evidence to suggest that they exist. White holes are hypothetical objects that are believed to exist at the other end of a hypothetical wormhole, which is a hypothetical tunnel-like connection between two points in spacetime. However, there is no direct evidence to suggest that wormholes exist either. The universe is full of mysteries, and our understanding of these phenomena continues to evolve as real scientific paradoxes. research progresses. Our quest for understanding these is only just beginning. As we continue to push the boundaries of our knowledge and explore the furthest reaches of space and time, we can be sure that the universe will continue to surprise and challenge us in new and unexpected ways, spurring us onto new heights of discovery and understanding. Venus is nearly identical to Earth in size, making it one of our most similar neighbors in the solar system. With a mean radius of about 3,760 miles or 6,052 kilometers, it's approximately 95% the size of Earth. Its mass is about 81.5% that of Earth. This similarity in mass and size means that Venus also has a comparable density to Earth, approximately 5.24 grams per cubic centimeter, implying a similar rock-iron composition. Venus and Earth have a comparable structure, a central iron core surrounded by a rocky mantle and a thin crust. The core of Venus, while not as well understood as that of Earth, is believed to be partially liquid, similar to Earth. This iron core is estimated to be about 2,000 miles or 3,200 kilometers in diameter. Above the core lies Venus's mantle, composed of silicon rock, that extends up to approximately 1,550 miles from the planet's center. This is overlaid by a thin crust estimated to be 6 to 12 miles thick. The rotation of Venus is a unique characteristic among the planets of our solar system. Unlike most other planets, which spin on their axes in the same direction that they orbit the Sun, Venus rotates in the opposite direction. This is a phenomenon that isn't yet fully understood by scientists, but some believe it may be due to a massive collision with a celestial body in the past, which altered the planet's rotational dynamics. Venus rotates extremely slowly with a sidereal day, a full rotation on its axis, taking 243 Earth days, the slowest rotation of any planet in the solar system. This slow rotation contributes to the planet's lack of a significant magnetic field. Another quirk of Venus rotation is that a solar day on Venus, the time from one sunrise to the next, is shorter than its sidereal day due to its retrograde rotation and orbit around the sun. The solar day on Venus is about 116.75 Earth days. The planet's year, the time it takes to orbit the Sun, is about 225 Earth days, 
which is shorter than its ideal day, making Venus one of the few planets where a day is longer than a year. The surface gravity on Venus is about 90% of the surface gravity on Earth. This means that if you were able to stand on Venus, you would feel slightly lighter than on Earth. However, the extreme atmospheric pressure and temperature would make it impossible for humans to survive without protection. Venus's surface appears to be geologically young, with a relatively low number of craters indicating a surface age between 300 million and 600 million years old. Scientists believe that Venus undergoes a cyclical process where heat from the planet's interior causes the surface to be repaved in a global resurfacing event. There is strong evidence of widespread volcanic activity on Venus. Thousands of volcanoes dot its surface, ranging from less than a mile in diameter to over 150 miles or 240 kilometers. The planet has far more volcanoes than any other in our solar system. However, there's currently no definitive evidence that these volcanoes are still active, although recent studies suggest that some may have erupted within the last few million years. Despite the apparent geological activity, Venus doesn't experience significant tectonic activity like Earth. While Venus does have mountain ranges and rift valleys similar to those seen in tectonically active regions on Earth, it lacks the kind of large, distinct tectonic plates seen on our home planet. This might be due to the planet's slow rotation, which limits the Coriolis effect necessary to drive large-scale tectonic activity. Venus' atmosphere is one of its most distinctive and intriguing characteristics. The atmosphere is primarily composed of carbon dioxide, 96.5%, with most of the remainder being nitrogen. However, there are also traces of other gases such as sulfur dioxide, water vapor, carbon monoxide, argon, and helium. This composition is vastly different from Earth's nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere, making Venus air toxic to humans and most known forms of life. The atmosphere of Venus is arranged in several layers, the troposphere extending from the surface to about 40 miles up, the mesosphere stretching from the top of the troposphere to about 56 miles high, and the thermosphere, which reaches up to 125 miles above the planet's surface. Above this, there's a transitional region called the high the concentration of carbon dioxide in Venus' atmosphere creates a strong greenhouse effect, trapping heat and making it the hottest planet in the solar system, even hotter than Mercury, which is closer to the sun. The greenhouse gases in the atmosphere absorb heat energy radiated from the sun, preventing it from escaping back into space. This results in surface temperatures averaging around 467 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to melt lead. There's very little temperature variation between day and night or between the equator and the poles due to the thick atmosphere's efficient heat distribution, resulting in a virtually constant furnace-like temperature all over the planet's surface. The atmospheric pressure on Venus is enormous, approximately 92 times greater than Earth's at sea level, equivalent to the pressure experienced 0.62 miles deep in Earth's oceans. A human exposed to such pressure without protection would be crushed. Despite this, high up in Venus's atmosphere, approximately 31 miles above the surface, the pressure and temperature conditions are similar to those on Earth's surface. Venus's atmosphere is perpetually cloaked in thick, opaque clouds that cover the entire planet. These clouds reflect about 75% of the sunlight that reaches Venus back into space, which is why Venus is so bright and easily visible from Earth. The winds in Venus's upper atmosphere are incredibly fast, reaching speeds up to 450 miles per hour, much faster than the strongest hurricane winds on Earth. These winds move in a phenomenon known as superrotation, where the atmosphere rotates much faster than the planet's surface. Near the surface, however, winds are much slower, typically less than a few miles per hour. Venus boasts the highest mountain in the solar system, Max Belmontes, rising 20 kilometers, about 12 miles, above Venus's mean surface level. The planet's surface is also marked by numerous impact craters, extensive lava flows, and unique surface features like corona, circular structures caused by the upwelling of hot material from the mantle, and arachnoids, circular structures with a complex pattern of fractures. Due to Venus's slow rotation and dense atmosphere, 
the planet doesn't experience significant seismic activity like Earth. However, recent studies suggest that Venus may still be geologically active. Venus has been a target of interest since the dawn of space exploration. The Soviet Union's Venera and Vega missions, NASA's Pioneer Venus, and the European Space Agency's Venus Express have all contributed significantly to our understanding of the planet. The Venera program achieved many firsts, including the first human-made device to enter the atmosphere of another planet and the first successful landing on another planet. These missions provided valuable data on Venus' atmosphere and surface. More recently, NASA's Magellan Orbiter mapped almost the entire surface of Venus using radar to penetrate the thick cloud cover. This mission revealed details about Venus's surface features and geology. Despite the challenges posed by Venus's harsh conditions, scientists are interested in further exploring the planet. NASA's planned Veritas and Da Vinci plus missions aim to study Venus's geologic history and atmospheric conditions, providing insights into whether Venus might have once harbored liquid water or even life. Meanwhile, the European Space Agency's Envision mission will focus on understanding why Venus and Earth took such different evolutionary paths. Japan's Akatsuki mission is currently studying Venus' atmosphere and weather patterns. Venus, our neighboring planet, is an intriguing world of extremes. Its harsh environment poses significant challenges to exploration, yet its similarity to Earth in size and composition, along with hints of potential past water and geologic activity, keep our curiosity alive. As we prepare for new missions to Venus, we stand on the brink of major discoveries that could reshape our understanding of the solar system and our place in it. As a reflection on our own planet's potential future, Venus serves as both a warning and an opportunity for scientific discovery. Space has always captured humanity's collective imagination. Among the pantheon of celestial bodies that have fascinated us, Jupiter stands out as the largest planet in our solar system. Its vibrant stripes and prominent great red spot make it easily recognizable. But there's far more to Jupiter than its size and famous storm, and our knowledge has grown exponentially with advancements in space technology and exploration. Jupiter is a gas giant consisting mostly of hydrogen and helium. Its diameter is approximately 11 times that of Earth, and it's so large that over 13 Earths could fit inside it. Despite its size, Jupiter has the shortest day of all the planets rotating Great on its axis on every 9 .9. A prominent and enduring storm is a remarkable feature of the planet's southern hemisphere, residing within a westward-moving jet stream called the South Equatorial Belt. The storm's red color has been a subject of extensive research, with proposals ranging from complex organic molecules to compounds containing sulfur as potential sources. This massive storm, rotating counterclockwise with a period of about six days, exhibits variability in its size, rotation speed, and color due to complex interactions with its environment. What's particularly intriguing about the Great Red Spot is its remarkable longevity, persisting for centuries, which can be attributed to Jupiter's rapid rotation and lack of a solid surface that minimizes the dissipation of the storm's energy. Understanding this enduring storm is not only essential in unraveling Jupiter's atmospheric dynamics, but also sheds light on broader principles governing atmospheres, including our own. Jupiter's four largest moons, named the Galilean moons after their discoverer Galileo Galilei, hold significant scientific interest. Io, the most volcanically active body in the solar system, boasts a colorful mottled appearance from its surface being covered in sulfur and sulfur dioxide. Europa's crushed ice surface suggests the potential presence of a subsurface ocean, making it a candidate for extraterrestrial life exploration. Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system, has its own magnetic field, and Callisto, characterized by an extremely cratered surface, is also believed to harbor a subsurface ocean. As of my last knowledge update in September 2021, Jupiter was known to have 79 moons, with the possibility of new discoveries beyond that date. In addition to its moons, Jupiter possesses faint rings primarily composed of dust particles originating from impacts on its small innermost moons. The Voyager 1 spacecraft discovered these rings in 1979. Over the years, multiple space missions, including Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, 
Galileo, and Juno have significantly contributed to our understanding of Jupiter's composition, magnetic field, and moons. These missions have provided valuable data ranging from close approaches to significant discoveries, such as detecting Jupiter's rings and confirming volcanic activity on Io. Jupiter, with its colossal size, complex atmospheric dynamics, multitude of moons, and faint ring system, remains an object of fascination for astronomers and space enthusiasts. Our continued exploration of Jupiter through telescopic observations and space missions holds the promise of unraveling new secrets, enriching our understanding not only of the vast, diverse nature of our solar system, but also of the possibilities of extraterrestrial life and civilizations. The hypothesis of natural filters in the universe proposes that advanced extraterrestrial civilizations may have been eradicated by various natural filters, from cataclysmic events and astrophysical phenomena to self-destructive behaviors inherent to intelligent societies. If extraterrestrial life exists, it may not necessarily resemble life on Earth as different planetary environments could lead to diverse forms of life with unique biochemistries and physical characteristics. The delicacy of rocky planets like Earth, which are considered ideal for supporting life, leaves them vulnerable to various threats. This fragility suggests that the universe could rapidly filter out intelligent life, emphasizing the importance of understanding the potential threats and challenges that face both our own planet and potential extraterrestrial civilizations. Violent stellar events, like gamma ray bursts, have the potential to sterilize planets over vast cosmic distances, with the capacity to affect entire galaxies. If a gamma ray burst were to occur in our galaxy, the Milky Way, from a distance of 100 light years, the resulting radiation could heat up the atmosphere, thin the ozone layer, and lead to devastating consequences such as incinerating life on the surface of land and water. This significant risk, combined with the potential for self-destruction by technologically advanced societies, poses grave threats to the longevity of civilizations. The brief existence of advanced civilizations, as observed in our own history, could explain the scarcity of observable long-lasting civilizations in our universe. This scarcity may be due to self-inflicted challenges and could explain the limited opportunities for communication with extraterrestrial beings. Discovering remnants of an extinct alien civilization could serve as a profound warning for humanity offering valuable lessons to avoid similar pitfalls. However, it's essential to recognize that our assumptions about extraterrestrial life often align with what we know about life on Earth. But life beyond our planet may evolve differently based on unique planetary conditions. For example, life on a super-Earth with higher gravity might be radically different from life on Earth, potentially making contact with such alien species challenging. The diversity of planets and stars in the universe opens up a world of possibilities for life that could be vastly different from what we are accustomed to. Ultimately, while the universe offers a vast playground with countless configurations of planets and stars, it's crucial to remain open to the possibility that extraterrestrial life may be radically different from life as we know it. Life on other planets could be tailored to different conditions, potentially making it unrecognizable compared to life on Earth. This broadens our understanding of the potential for diverse forms of life existing beyond our planet. These subtle differences could create an entirely distinct ecosystem. So the big question is, can an alien organism truly adapt to our ecosystem when it lands on Earth? It's a cosmic mystery waiting to unfold. Our sun, positioned at the center of the solar system, serves as the primary source of light, heat, and crucially life. However, the trajectory of its future is a subject of inquiry for scientists who are peering into the vastness of space for answers. These scientists, akin to contemporary prophets, foretell a potentially apocalyptic fate for our sun. The implications are astounding. The Earth's surface temperature is projected to reach levels capable of melting rock and indeed the entire planetary surface. Scientists are aware that at some point in the future, the sun will undergo fundamental changes that will impact the planets in our solar system. Picture fast-forwarding 7 billion years ahead to witness the solar system's eventual demise. This foresight is possible because the transformations anticipated for our sun are already observable in numerous other stars. Among these stars, some are referred to as solar twins due to their striking similarities to our sun. 
The study of solar twins is crucial not only for comprehending the sun itself, but also for gaining insights into the future of our solar system. In 2013, scientists identified a solar twin named Carrot Sol 1, situated in the Monastero's constellation. Carrot bears a resemblance to the sun in terms of both mass and other characteristics. However, astronomers made a noteworthy discovery. Carrazzo 1 exhibited a lower concentration of lithium, a key element that facilitated an accurate determination of its age. It turned out that this star is slightly older than the sun by a few billion years. By observing stars older than our sun, scientists can glean valuable information about the sun's future trajectory. As the sun ages, it will undergo a significant increase in brightness. This heightened luminosity is a result of an ongoing internal transformation within the sun, where two opposing forces engage in a constant struggle. These forces are akin to those influencing a hot air balloon, with the immense pressure of hot gas pushing up and outwards within the sun. This pressure is generated by the process of nuclear fusion, where hydrogen is converted into helium. The sun has sustained this fusion process for billions of years, marking its enduring battle against gravity. The sun's life is essentially a perpetual conflict between gravitational forces attempting to compress the star and the outward thermal pressure exerted by the gas. The delicate equilibrium between these forces has kept the sun stable for 4.5 billion years. However, with the passage of time, this balance is gradually shifting. As the sun continues to fuse hydrogen, it produces an astonishing 600 million tons of helium every second. The alteration in density has a profound impact on nuclear reactions. As the core becomes denser, the rate of hydrogen burning increases, akin to turning up the burners. This translates to an escalation in the energy emanating from the core. Consequently, our sun is becoming 10% brighter with each passing billion years. As it ages, the solar system experiences a rise in temperature. Scientists are aware that this ongoing process will eventually lead to significant consequences. The habitable zone where Earth resides, this region orbits a band around the sun and is characterized as the habitable zone because it maintains the ideal temperature for liquid water. This unique condition makes Earth the sole planet in the solar system where life can thrive. However, as the sun intensifies its power Besides from detecting a significant amount of deuterium, a heavy form of hydrogen indicating the presence of water in the planet's past suggests that Venus was once a drastically different world, resembling a beautiful water world not unlike Earth. Approximately 3 billion years ago, as the sun's luminosity increased, it had a profound impact on Venus water. The rising temperature of the sun had a cascading effect on Venus, causing the water to transform into steam due to the intense heat. This steam, being a greenhouse gas, trapped solar radiation, leading to a continuous temperature escalation on Venus, ultimately resulting in a runaway greenhouse effect and making Venus the hottest planet in our solar system. Due to the sun becoming brighter and evaporating Earth's oceans, the impact on Earth is expected to be significantly more severe than the currently observed effects of human-induced global warming. Over the next two billion years, Earth's temperatures are projected to soar, presenting a significant challenge for life to adapt or face extinction. Regions could experience temperature increases of up to 20 degrees, driving a profound evolution in life as we understand it. This climatic shift will likely lead to the adoption of various strategies for survival, such as animals hibernating during scorching summers and remaining active in cooler winters, and plant adaptations to survive harsh conditions. In less than one billion years, the greenhouse effect is anticipated to intensify, causing temperatures to rise dramatically. This heat could render even winters inhospitable for most organisms, potentially leading to the extinction of warm-blooded large animals like bison. As the land becomes hotter, it's predicted that descendants of bison, similar to the ancestors of dolphins, may need to transition from land to water for survival. In just over a billion years, the once thriving land could transform into a barren desert devoid of life. Water is projected to have disappeared within two billion years, and Earth will resemble present-day Venus in less than three billion years. It is believed that the scorching sun, combined with a runaway greenhouse effect, will likely eradicate nearly all life on Earth. Although intelligent life may find a way out through the use of technology, 
potentially migrating to other planets like Mars as Earth becomes inhospitable. An interesting historical event related to solar activity in 1859 is the phenomenon known as the aurora, caused in part by a solar flare, highlighting the potential for violent solar events to impact Earth's technological world. Despite the sun being a nearly perfect sphere that has been burning hydrogen into helium for the last five billion years, it is not immune to solar flares, explosions of plasma particles, and radiation, which can travel far into space as the solar wind. Astronomers continuously monitor our star to predict the occurrence of solar storms, such as coronal mass ejections, CNAs, which have the potential to disrupt modern technological society. Therefore, scientists are engaged in the continuous study of solar activity to understand the potential impact on Earth and to develop strategies for predicting and mitigating the effects of such events. In 1859, Richard Christopher Carrington observed the sun and detected a coronal mass ejection, CME, which caused a widespread aurora and minor interruptions in telegraph systems. This event, known as the Carrington Event, raised concerns about the potential impact of solar storms on modern technology. CMEs, which involve the release of large amounts of charged particles from the sun's surface, can disrupt power systems and technology on Earth. Despite advances in space weather prediction, the unpredictability of CME occurrence and their potential impact on technology remains a challenge. Efforts are underway to improve understanding and prediction of space weather, including the launch of new solar probes to study CMEs and their effects. While current solar activity is relatively low, the long-term forecast for space weather remains uncertain, highlighting the ongoing need for research and preparedness. The Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter launched by NASA and the European Space Agency, ESA, respectively, aim to study the sun and its effects on the solar system. The probes will measure the sun's gas and magnetic fields, study sunspots, flares, and coronal mass ejections, and observe the sun's magnetic field dynamics. These missions are expected to enhance our understanding of solar activity and improve prediction of space weather, potentially helping to anticipate future coronal mass ejections. The text also explains the eventual fate of the sun, detailing its transformation into a red giant, its impact on Earth, and the cooling and freezing of the solar system.